Hi, Boise. It's Emma. Do you want to support local farmers while enjoying fresh, pesticide-free food? You've got to check out Global Gardens. They're a nonprofit that supports local farmers from refugee backgrounds in the Treasure Valley. And with their 2023 CSA program, you can eat delicious veggies all season long. You can choose how much you get, and they have convenient pickup locations in Boise and Meridian, plus home delivery. Register now at globalgardensboise.org. Today on CityCast Boise... It's finally Friday, and I've got Blake Hunter and Frankie Barnhill with me to dig into the week's news. We've got the rather wishy-washy results of the investigation into the Boise Police Department, an update on an alleged sexual predator performing here tonight, and some bad news for book banners. It's Friday, May 19th. I'm Emma Arnold, and this is what Boise's talking about. Hi, Blake. Hi, Frankie. Hey. Hi. Thanks for being here. Uh, Happy Friday to both of you. We made it. We made it. Yeah. (laughs) Through another one. Well, let's start with this story. We've all been keeping a close eye on this one. Uh, The firm that conducted the investigation into the Boise Police Department presented their findings to the city council this week. Blake, remind us why this investigation was done in their first place. Right. So if you remember the just absolute chaos that happened for a few months at uh, the Boise Police Department last fall and like early winter. This was kind of part of it. Uh, So it started with a journalist found that now retired um, police captain uh, Matt Bringleson had just a lot of horrible white supremacist views, um, just like very vehement and was scheduled to speak at this like white supremacist uh, conference. Um, and he had retired like a couple months earlier um, and he was like speaking under a pseudonym and that kind of thing. And Mayor Lauren McLean announced that she was going to be launching an investigation into this essentially to not dive more into his rhetoric or what he said, but trying to determine if um, his racism kind of they use the term infected the rest of the department. And. So they, they've they been doing this for a while. They ran out of money at one point. They had $500,000 right. to do this investigation. Uh, they ran out of money, got a little extra money. What did they end up finding? They have essentially said that there was no widespread racism. And it, it, this is the thing that's kind of making me laugh just because it's, I don't know, I, I don't understand why we're taking that at face value of just saying that there's no widespread racism because the lead investigator then said, I have quote unquote, very low confidence in these findings uh, because they weren't able to fully complete everything, like the full scope of what they wanted to do. But essentially they found that there wasn't, um, they said that there wasn't any super widespread racism, but they did kind of come away with some findings and things like that. They said that there were a lot of internal issues, which we can get into more. But yeah, essentially the takeaway as it stands right now is, quote unquote, no widespread racism. Yeah. But so like you said, there was a hundred thousand documents that they weren't able to look through because they didn't have they did no longer had the funding to do it. Uh, And they didn't look through a ton of body cam footage obtained Mm -hmm. from BPD. So, yeah, it feels like uh, in in my gut feeling on that is uh, that probably affected the outcome quite a bit. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to imagine how it wouldn't. Um, Mm -hmm. And obviously it affected the the endorsement that the investigator was able to give to this to these findings, um, he said that there were a hundred more than a hundred thousand documents that they weren't able to dive into. From where it stands right now, I don't know, you know, where those documents came from. If it was like a certain part of the investigation that they didn't get into, that kind of thing. Um, but like you said, the the investigation ran through five hundred thousand um, dollars, and then they presented these findings earlier this week at a Tuesday city council meeting, and then. At that meeting, the city council also approved an additional $150,000, but that's not for continued investigation. It's for work that they'd already done. So basically paying them retroactively. So I highly doubt that we're going to get anything more or 
anyone will ever really dig into those documents because the mayor does, has said that this is kind of case closed. Some, uh, something that stuck out to me uh, that I felt like, you know, kind of in, in their findings, one of the things was uh, that the police academy has not failed a single recruit in the past decade, uh, right. which they, they were like, that's super concerning, you know. Uh, in in just about any other field, ten to fifteen percent of people, you know, flunk out of any mm-hmm. kind of training for no police officer in a decade. Uh, no, so so they're just passing pretty much anybody because they're short staffed. I thought that was, was there anything else that stuck out to you that would really stuck out to me. Yeah, I mean, there's there's certain training and like bars that people are supposed to be able to hit for a reason. And either the standards are really low or they're just like being very lenient on a personal level. Um, Obviously, there's a lot of kind of, you know, when you think of police, a lot of people often kind of think of a social structure in which there's a lot of like forgiveness and like people are very lenient and protective of one another. Um, And this absolutely feels like it falls into that. Like this, this doesn't really give, I mean... It's difficult to take the quote unquote no widespread racism um, because, you know, it, this doesn't actually increase, I think, anyone's trust um, in policing as it currently stands. And of course, this is going to be a huge, huge talking point as we move forward into the mayoral election this year. Um, but another big, po- big finding and kind of recommendation that they made, um, there were some things like, you know, you got to record audio on body cam footage, um, which felt like. Yeah. Yeah. We should be doing that. Um, also, you know, got to be keeping training records better. Um, and a big one was they need the department needs to work on how it internally promotes people. It was really funny. There's a quote from like 2009 or 2006 or something like that, where one of Bringleson's fellow sergeants said, if he is promoted, keeps getting promoted up and up, we're going to be reading about him someday in the newspaper. And it's like, well, here we are. Um, So there was a lot of issues. A lot of people said that he was just like really rude um, to the public. And, you know, he was liked but not respected and that kind of thing. So a big takeaway in, in this is that the department needs to work on how it internally hires and promotes and trains and all of these different steps of the process. Yeah, I thought that was an interesting, uh, you know, the probe uncovered that he that Bringleson had been promoted to leadership three different times under multiple yeah. chiefs, uh, even though everybody was like calling him lazy, cruel, dismissive. He also had uh, 11 uh, extensive internal affairs uh, complaints and uh, known substance abuse problems, severe mental health problems. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's sort of interesting that that the, the takeaway from this seems to be like, well, we don't know what's going on down there, but it's not racism. And I'm like, we're sure. We're sure that this, yeah, hmm, no, it's not. <laughs> yeah, I think it's good to remember too that he was not officially a spokesperson, but he was the host of the Boise Police Department's podcast before That's he retired. Right. I forgot. Um, I mean, yeah, Blake, I'm glad you brought up the election piece of this. Like, how much do we think this is uh, Mayor McLean and city council members trying to be like, okay, we did the thing, we did the yeah. report, <laughs> we're putting it behind us, uh, we've got an election coming up, and oh, by the way, uh, the mayor's leading um, competitor right now is the former uh, police chief, Mike Masterson, who's making policing a big part of it. I mean, ugh, it feels yeah. a little bit like, let's move on, everybody. <laughs> yeah, well, we looked into it. It looks good. <laughs> it looks all good. Yeah. I also think that it's it's just really frustrating looking, you know, there's kind of the whole electoral drama of it. And then there's also the key issue of this is policing. This is, you know, the largest um, the largest amount of funding that we have locally goes to our police force. And they're armed and like all of these things. And so it's just really frustrating that this policing is going to be Probably up there with housing is like the top two biggest talking points of this mayoral race. And I do not expect, based on how this has played out so far, I do not expect that either group or anyone really is going to be able to really dig into trying to create a level of trust or figuring out solutions for how to build trust uh, between the police and the community. And so, you know, there's the whole mayoral drama of it. And then it's also just extremely frustrating, to be honest. Yeah, absolutely. Agree with that, especially with in light of, uh, you know, the news last night that a Meridian police officer repeatedly punched uh, someone in the face Mm -hmm. while handcuffed. Yeah, while handcuffed. 
it will be interesting to see how this plays out because you have a lot of people in the community who uh, who are very concerned with the police actions, have been very concerned with police brutality and protesting against it and stuff. And then you have quite a few people in our community who believe that the cops are entitled to treat a suspect however they want. As you yeah. know, so pretty far sides of this spectrum on this debate. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see. This episode is brought to you by the new Disney Plus original series, American Born Chinese. Based on the graphic novel by Jean Luen Yang, American Born Chinese tells the story of an average teenager that becomes entangled in a battle with Chinese mythological gods. This star-studded cast includes Academy Award winners Michelle Yeoh and Ki Hoi Kwan, plus Daniel Wu, Jim Liu, and Ben Wang. American Born Chinese, premiering May 24, exclusively on Disney Plus. Well, uh, let's move on to this story. I wish we weren't talking about this today again, but unfortunately, uh, comedian Chris D'Elia is still performing here at the Idaho Central Arena. Frankie, what's the latest on this? Yeah, so, uh, Emma, I definitely want to tap into what you think on this big time because you brought this to our attention back in January when the Idaho Central Arena announced as part of uh, uh, this L.A.-based comedian's tour that he would be at the Idaho Central Arena. Um, And at the same time, there are multiple and gathering allegations of sexual abuse, um, assault, and harassment against him The latest is he's still set to perform. I'm on the Idaho Central Arena uh, website right now. Tickets are still available. We have reached out multiple times back in January and then again just this past week to the Idaho Central Arena um, over social media, over uh, using their contact form, over calling the office, over emailing directly, and have not heard anything, just any comment on uh, this particular booking, why they made it, and if they're at all concerned about these allegations against him. Yeah, um, this is the second article uh, in the last few months that Rolling Stone has done uh, about this alleged sexual predator and tons of victims coming forward, tons of people talking about this. The FBI is looking into it. I feel like I would have been shocked five years ago. Pre Me Too, I would have been shocked that he's performing here. But in in recent you know years, I've started to be like, oh, this is the market. Like there's a mm-hmm. market for this. And uh, the Idaho Central Arena seems to be perfectly willing to make money off of this touring um, alleged sexual assaulter and, you know, uh, someone who has preyed on multiple teenagers, allegedly. So, yeah, uh, I'm I was surprised that they never, ever commented to anybody. I've seen tons of people calling them out on social media. I also I think it's interesting, you know, uh, ICCU, Idaho Central Credit Union, um, pulled their money from Pride uh, over, you know, made up groomer concerns about a kid drag event, um, pulled their, pulled a bunch of money from Pride. And I just think it's interesting because like when you go to the website, there it is, their logo right mm-hmm. next to Chris D'Elia's face and name. And I'm like, how how could you possibly want this press? How could you possibly, as, even in, you know, even if we'll say that in good faith, I don't believe this, but in good faith, they pulled their money from Pride because they thought they were doing the right thing. Then how would you possibly continue to support this event and have your name on it? Yeah, especially with these new revelations. As you said, yeah. the Rolling Stone found that even the FBI is looking into this and taking this seriously. So uh, will they listen? There's still a few hours before the <laughs> event tonight. Uh, yeah. He's also performing in Salt Lake tomorrow. Uh, perhaps that venue will make a different decision as of right now. The venue in Salt Lake still has tickets available as well. I want if you're if you're listening and you're not somebody who follows a lot of comedy or maybe you you watch a little here on Netflix, um, just like professionally, uh, he's not also, he's also not funny. Uh, just my <laughs> professional opinion is he's one of the worst working comedians out there, aside from being uh, a danger to your to your children. Um, he's also a terrible comedian. Um, and also just proof that anytime you see a comedian who's whose tour or album or press is built around being canceled, how absolutely mm. bullshit that is. Like, yep. there's clearly nothing in comedy that can get you canceled. Uh, we've seen that time and again with Cosby and a lot of these other guys. So, I mean, I, I, I'm I, sad that, you know, my hometown is, is hosting him and uh, it's a bummer to me. I'm sure some of the people going don't understand 
uh, what he's about or the allegations. Maybe they just don't know. They're like, oh, I saw I just saw it was a comedian and that'd be fun. But I think a fair number of people are fans of his because he uh, is a good reminder to women that we are not safe, you know, and that we are. uh, It's a great way to to uh, watch bad comedy and dehumanize women at the same time, like real multitasking shit. So uh, real bummed that they're doing that. But, you know, oh, well. Yeah, just in general, if anybody at the Idaho Central Arena wants to comment, we are still open to having a conversation about this. So yeah. please uh, reply to m- any one of our many uh, requests for comment on this particular <laughs> booking. <laughs> yeah, been a lot of them. Well, let's let's move on. I We actually have some like good news, in my opinion, to talk about election results. Frankie, there was some really great news in there for local libraries and fans of libraries. Yes. On Tuesday, uh, folks in Ada County and Meridian uh, and CUNA and uh, and, uh, several other places around the state, too. But uh, those spots in the Treasure Valley went to the polls and decided who they wanted to have on their library boards. Uh, I mentioned this last Friday, but how great it is that people are so invested in such hyper local elections. We don't always see that. But of course, there has been this uh, turn from uh, far right conservatives in particular to focus on libraries. Well, let's start in Meridian because it's been the probably the biggest one that people are focused on. The two incumbents who were um, against, uh, you know, censorship and book bans in general, um, of course, wanting to hear more from the community when people have concerns, they they won. So the uh, one candidate who was challenging incumbent Destiny Hart, his name was uh, Javier Torres. He was actually one of the people who signed that petition to dissolve the district, and he did not win. Uh, neither did David Tiziker, who uh, lost to incumbent Josh Cummings. Um, and Josh Cummings had come out saying, you know, hey, I'm a I'm a conservative. I'm a Republican, but I am not about this censorship crap. So, yeah, Meridian uh, came through for sure in support of libraries and in support of uh, folks being able to access books that they want. And then similar thing in Ada County, two candidates who were anti book bans, one out. So really good news for people who care about this. Yeah, exciting. And, you know, Blake, you and I have talked about this before, but it really when the Meridian Library, uh, the petition to dissolve it was denied by the Ada County Commission. You and I talked about how like kind of feels like maybe the far right's attempts to censor libraries backfiring on them, like making them look bad. Good reminder that Idaho is a lot more moderate than you think, you know? I mean, yeah. Talk about kind of the... uh the conversation around like open primaries and stuff right now, you know, like the Republican primary keeps just pushing things further to the right. And this, I think, is one area in which um, we're all kind of trying to get a temperature check of how far um, the people of Idaho actually want to go. So, yeah, I mean, the Meridian Library District and Nick Grove, the director there, must just be like riding high right now. They've just gotten such two such kind of resounding approvals of their work. Um, and like endorsements from the public and from their voters over the last uh, just few months because the you know the the petition to dissolve the district was not that long ago. It was just earlier this spring. But yeah, it does kind of feel like this is maybe one area where people are really drawing the line. Um, we've seen a few of those, you know, people really like their ballot initiatives. like they you know, they kind of see that move to like restrict ballot initiatives for what it is. I think people understand, um, like see book bans for what they are and don't really appreciate them. And so this, I'm interested to see whether the libraries and book bans are a place that the far right continues to focus attention over the next few years. Um, Because if, you know, if we keep having this conversation here, that means that this conversation is definitely going to spread further across the nation as well. But we'll, we'll see how this plays out. I think that this might be a bit of a turning point for them. Um, And they might have to kind of rethink this a little bit. Yeah, it seems like they'd have to uh, revamp their strategy or although maybe not, because if they have legislator, you know, legislators in their pocket, then they can, you know, put try to push that through uh, on a state level. So, well, I I did see the West Ada uh, school district uh, levy did fail. So, Frankie, what happens now for them? Yeah. So that was that 500 million uh, levy. It was a record uh, setting number and it did fail by uh, 13%. They needed to get 55% of the vote. Um, you know, and the quote from the the district was obviously they are uh, disappointed about this. And uh, but it doesn't sound like they're, you know, giving up on this idea. And so 
The thing that I think is fascinating is uh, then look at Valley View, which passed their $78 million bond issue on Tuesday. And this was after a similar measure failed last fall. Um, there was some really great analysis by Kevin Richard with Idaho Ed News about this, this kind of idea of, OK, if a district can't get a bond or a levy passed one election, they can try again and perhaps they rein it in. Maybe they change what the goals of the, the measure is. Maybe they, um, you know, carve some of the money out. So it's not quite as expensive for voters, uh, but they come back and oftentimes they pass. So since Valley View uh, was able to pass their bond after a second try, I think that gives uh, West Ada a reason to potentially bring this back again. And maybe they'll maybe they'll have to pare it down. Um, maybe they'll have to, you know, do a little bit more voter education around this. Um, but I don't think this is the last we've heard on West Ada, which is the fastest growing uh, district in the state and, you know, is popping at the seams um, with all these kids who are needing to go to school and use their public public school facilities. So I don't think it's over. Yeah. And I wonder if they'll have you know, maybe more luck uh, in years to come because um, this this is entirely anecdotal. But a couple people I know said that they had family members who said they were voting against it because they had heard a bunch of misinformation about what the money was for, that it was that it wasn't needed, that it was just, you know, extra garbage that they were getting and not like desperately, desperately needed money. So I wonder if they'll uh, in coming years realize that they really have to push back against some some pretty real misinformation to to try and get that money through. Yeah, potentially. Right. You're saying I mean, it was like roofing and flooring updates. And then, yes, needing to build new schools, because, again, uh, that growth is just not stopping Meridian. And it's become known as a really family friendly town. So if you want to keep that reputation up, then uh, probably need to increase uh, the funding to the schools directly there. Of course, there's the legislature that we have to be aware of. And there uh, have been some in uh, Kevin Richards analysis. He, he talked a little bit about how the legislature is paying close attention to these repeat bonds. And some folks, uh, especially in the far right camp, aren't too particularly happy to see bond issues come back more than once and uh, then get passed a sec- on the second or third attempt. But as of right now, you know, that's still a mechanism that that districts have available to them. Well, thank you both for hopping in here and helping me figure out the week's news. And uh, yeah, a lot of things to keep an eye on uh, going forward, but a little bit of good news in there, too. Yeah. Thanks, Emma. Have a good weekend. Yeah. Stay cool. It's going to get hot this weekend. That's all for today here on CityCast Boise. The show is produced by Frankie Barnhill, Evelyn Avitia, and me, Emma Arnold. Blake Hunter writes our Hey Boise newsletter, and our music is by Up Is The, Down Is The. If you enjoyed our show today, leave us a review. It helps other people find us. We'll be back Monday with more stories from around the city. Bye. Bye.